Hello there YouTube, this is Mr. Gibson Guy here. Uh, thanks for tuning back into the channel. If you're new here, uh, make sure you hit us the subscribe button and give this video a like. Leave us a comment down below. I love to hear from people what they think about the videos and get to re try to respond to everybody that does. Um, my last video, I had just, uh, just arrived, my uh, Pentax LX, and <clears throat> I did a video on, including that, on a video about uh, the flagship cameras from each of the big five uh, camera companies for the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, that was kind of a long video, but it had a lot of information on it, a lot of different cameras, all the, the pro cameras of the day back then. And today I'm going to zero in on the LX, which of course is one of those flagship cameras. Uh, you see just to the left of the LX a Pentax MX, and this was the... Uh, mechanical flagship of the Pentax line in the 1970s and it was uh, one that was very small it was designed after the OM-1 to kind of compete with that and uh, it was a professional series but it had a little problem that it came out in 1975 and that w it's an all mechanical camera which is wonderful but that was right when cameras were all going automatic exposure and this was a manual exposure camera so it came out just about three years too late and it never really caught on that much but it's a wonderful camera um, it's actually a little tiny bit smaller than the OM-1 which is kind of hard to believe but they actually made it a little bit smaller and uh, it's very similar to the OM-1, but uh, so the flagship camera kind of transferred to the ME line of Pentax and the ME, ME Super, ME Pro Super program and uh, the different ones that were spun off of that, but that was more of a, a consumer camera, not a real uh, professional camera, which the MX was. So in the early 1980s, Pentax had gotten their act together and they came out with a new professional camera for the 1980s. And that was the Pentax LX. You see right here. And we're going to take a closer look at this and learn about what it is and compare it with the, the other pro cameras of the time. Uh, the LX follows very closely along the lines of the MX, except that it does have automatic exposure, of course. It has a lock button on the shutter, like the MX. It has its winder just right here, and it has the shutter speed dial right here, right next to it. Um, but this shutter speed dial does not have an auto setting. This one does. Um, this one takes the ASA on the back here, around the coaxial to the rewind knob. And here the ASA is written into the shutter speed dial, right here. Um, but let's, uh, let's, well, let's, let's take a look here at, at uh, just what Pentax had going on with this one. This, the uh, LX, right here, see that LX? Uh, is actually the Roman numeral L, Roman numeral X, which stands for the Roman numeral number 60. And when Pentax came out with the LX, it was on the 60th anniversary of Asahai uh, Optical Company, which is Pentax. And it was a professional model along the lines of the MX, a little bit bigger but still definitely smaller than the other professional cameras at the time so it was uh, it had all the features and everything but put into a smaller lighter package they also greatly beefed up all of the weather sealing and dirt sealing so the 
that protected the inside of this camera, it was a lot harder for dirt and fluid to get inside the camera because they put a lot of extra seals on it um, for being a professional camera. Uh, it, like the other big name ones, the Canon and the, and the Nikons of the period, it has removable finder and exchangeable finder. They have different different ones. We'll take that off and look at it in a minute. Uh, let me talk to you about uh, this, how I got to here. Um, I have, if you've seen my other videos, you've seen my cabinet full of cameras and you know there's always some to pull out to look at and I have a pretty decent collection of stuff from the 1970s and 1980s. All, all uh, manual focus, of course, and no autofocus stuff. That was the end of the line for me. But uh, I had, I started out getting a camera and a couple more cameras, and then I found that, oh, hey, here's a Pentax MX. I've only seen one one time, and that was in 1977. And uh, other cameras like these are cameras that all through the years I collected and, uh, and I realized so pretty recently that one camera that was really interesting that I never had or never saw I think I saw one one time at a camera show in Jacksonville but uh, the uh, that was the Pentax LX and so I thought I really should look into getting one of those so I did the usual thing I go on eBay or Macari and few different places and search around and see who has them and see what the prices are and pretty quickly I came to the conclusion that I could get one that wor worked for uh, about $300 plus shipping and the shipping can vary greatly uh, so I've started looking through eBay and stuff like that nothing really caught my eye and I have to have something that that gets my attention uh, to zero in on one particular camera to decide, you know, maybe I'll go ahead and spring for it. And I, you know, I got the money, but uh, do I want? I don't want to spend more than I have to. But uh, you know, I'm looking for a fair deal, and every once in a while I get something that's not working. But usually it, it is, you know, or if it's not working, I can get it working. So I looked at this one, and I could tell that on the uh, on the uh, Pentaprism that it had some brassing, had some wear and tear on it, and uh, that was there. But the rest of the camera looked pretty good. I, this one that I came across, and it was uh, it was three hundred dollars plus shipping, which wasn't very expensive. I think it was like uh, seventeen or something for shipping coming from Japan. But what got my attention was that this this camera also had the auto winder which is kind of a rare thing and I thought oh well, auto winder right I, I like motor drives I think they're pretty cool auto winders um, can have their place I wasn't real thrilled by them I, I uh, started just in this past year or so to really have a much more gracious acceptance of the auto winder and see the significance of it and this one especially but uh, so I did some research on it first thing I did was I went on eBay and I checked the prices and I found out you look up LX motor drives you can find them all day for a hundred dollars um, but with a catch but the LX winder is more rare and they seem to be going for a hundred and fifty dollars and I thought, well, wait a minute, $150 for an auto winder and $100 for the motor drive. Well, there must be some catch here. You know what? There was a catch there. Whether you take an Icon F2 or a Canon at new F1 or a F3 or something. Well, not the F3, but uh, you see this line right here on this motor drive? That's because... The motor drive is here. This is a battery compartment. They're made out of plastic. This one is fairly sturdy. It's Nikon one. 
but you know that's kind of the thing that gets put down this one is definitely the plastic one on this motor this is the motor drive here and this is the battery compartment that holds 12 AA batteries Let's see how I have it in here no it's empty yeah, there's no batteries in it. Man, that's heavy without batteries. Well, what happens with the LX as well is these separate plastic battery compartments, people keep putting the cameras down on them, and eventually they break. Or you might have a battery compartment, a battery set, uh, chamber that attaches to your bottom of your motor drive and it has nickel cadmium batteries in it you can recharge it well the problem is that those nickel cadmium batteries that you recharge are good for three maybe up to even five years if you're lucky if you want to squeeze the last bit of juice out of them but then they're dead and you have to go back to canon or nikon or pentax or whoever made it olympus and you have to buy new battery packs and those new battery packs existed for a while, but they don't anymore. So the only battery pack that does you any good is the one that actually holds AA cells. NICAD packs are no good. And if you hit a motor drive with that nice slim lined NICAD uh, re battery pack on the bottom of your motor drive, which was lightweight and gave you good performance until the batteries ran low, you don't have one anymore. You can't use the old one that you still have because those NICAD batteries aren't any good and they're not standard Nikon ba NICAD batteries. You'd have to get those from a supplier or something. So that's why there's a whole bunch of these motor drives from these cameras and for this camera floating around but they can't use them. And they you plug it into the wall if you get the AC adapter to it, but all that stuff is no longer in production. It's long gone, so you'd have to really search around to find one. But if you got a Nikon F3, it has the battery pack built into the motor. And there's your battery pack. It's all part of the motor, and so as a result, they made this a lot more heavy duty than they did those little battery boxes that came on the other cameras. So if you have these, one of the reasons why the F3 and the MD4 is such popular setup is because it was much more rugged. The, the F2 and the Canon F1 are using plastic battery boxes and they're, a lot of them are not around anymore. Uh, also, this is the auto winder. And we'll take a look at that too. Auto winder, not a motor drive. So it contains your four batteries. Auto winders, by the way, we define as taking four 1.5 volt double A's. It says bat. Where's the bat? It's right here. No, it's here. There. Bat batteries. There, there they go, just like that, and they work. And that's f the four batteries make mean a six volt motor, and we call a six volt motor an auto winder. The other cameras will take eight batteries or sometimes 12, so 12 volts or 18 volts. You get, is that right? Yeah, six, right, six and 12 is 18. So, 18 volt motor. 12 volt motor, 12 volt motor, um, but this, the, the motor drive that went with the LX looks just like the auto winder. I'll show you from the side, you can see it's got a little bit of a contour to it, like that. That's the battery box. That's where you have auxiliary power input to it. And here's your controls on the back. Um, You have a button you push here, and that is for uh, releasing the film that's already been exposed so you can rewind it back into the canister. And let's do something here. Let's turn this on. 
I don't have a lens on here yet. Uh, let's see. Whoa, look at that. That line's pretty good. I'll show you something though. After you have shot your film, then you can press this button here. This little red button. No, it's a little black button. And that, hold that down and push this lever over here. And look what's hopping up here. Watch this. See that? That's film rewind. It winds it back into the canister itself. Um, this is the only auto winder that I am aware of that rewinds film like some motor drives do. This motor drive does. This motor drive doesn't. This motor drive doesn't. But this one does and it's an auto winder not a motor drive. So we've seen that um, we go over, let's go over the controls on this so you see how I ended up with that. So this auto winder is a really great deal. Alright, so let's take a look at what we have on the camera here. We've seen the auto winder. This is FP and F, X. That's for X sync, that's for flash bulbs, FP. And that's a contact for something that I don't know, but I could use some of those on it. Another auto wonder I have. All right, now we saw the LX on here, and then we have a dial here that goes around, and we got a couple of release buttons here. And this window, if I can show you this, in this window right here, you can see it's set for ASA 400, and you press this little slot down here. And you can change that there. It's the ASA 800, ASA 1600, ASA 3200. Let's put it back to 400. No, oh, looks like 200. 400, yeah, I think that's it. All right, so a little button that you press down there lets you set the ASA here in the little window and then there's another little button right here and you press that down and you see there's here you have one one half one fourth one two four and this is for overexposure and underexposure exposure compensation settings press that button and there you go then it turns see down to so it's plus or minus two stops and then it stops right on heaven on one right there but this little button that we press is not just used for that uh, one of the cool things about Pentax is they use these things more than once this button does this it also does this you press this down and you push this over this way Got to get the timing just right here. Press. I knew I needed to cut my fingernails before I did this. do this to me. You were working before. When I, come on, you worked in rehearsal. Ah. There. All right, got it. Then you see that releases the pentaprism for this. And this is the regular FA1 pentaprism. <sighs> they have another FA1W or something like that, which is similar to this. But this one gives you from zero to one and a half diopters 
um, eye relief adjustment. So I wear uh, reading glasses, and so with this one set at one and a half, it gives me perfect view through the finder. If I had if I was had really bad eyes, I'd have to get the FA1W, which goes from uh, zero to four. But this it just does one and a half diopters, and that works for me. And See, yeah, right up there, you can see that's the readout for the uh, for the the uh, viewfinder display. It's picked up by the viewfinder and brought in there, and this is my viewfinder. And it's got a little bit of brassing on it, but it's not really too bad a shape. Got all the electrical contacts. This is only for viewing. It does not control exposure. All that's done inside the camera body. Not like the old days. So put this back on. It lined up correctly. Come on, line up correctly. There we go. That's it. And it's back on. Now I have to fight with it to take it off again. So we have used this one twice, and this. I don't know why it was doing that. But we don't need to do that anymore. Then you got a memo box for your back of your film, uh, the back of the auto winder, and we know we have this button to press for battery. That's why it says be it bat on it. And this one we press to rewind the film and to engage this thing here. It doesn't work because it's not turned on right now. This is for tightening down the uh, auto winder and Continuous, off, and single. That's how that works. And a little red LED that comes on when it's fo when it's working. All right. Over on the other side, we have our like we had on the MX. We have our shutter speed dial, and it has an automatic setting that lines up with this little little white line there. Automatic white line. And when you want to take it off automatic, you press this little button. Let's see if this one works better. You press this little button. Ah, there we go. And you have a two thousandth, a one thousandth, five hundred, two fifty, one twenty-five, X, which is ninety, then sixtieth, thirtieth, fifteenth, eighth, quarter, half one second and then two seconds and four seconds and B for bulb for continuous now this is the important stuff to know about this this one is automatic the speeds from the X-Sync 190th on up are all mechanical in this camera that means battery or no, you have 190th of a second and all the way up to 2,000th of a second to work. You won't have a meter, but the camera will use all of those speeds. The speeds below 60, down to 30, down to 4 seconds, these are all electronic speeds and you can only use them when you have batteries in the camera. But as long as you have batteries, you can do that. But if you don't have batteries, you got this much, 190th and higher. So that gives you a lot to do. We have a uh, exposure readout for how many exposures you have taken on the roll of film. And we have, just like on the MX, the little lock. Now it's locked. And here, it's not locked. Um, the hot shoe is wired in. We saw those four little contacts in there. So that it connects directly to the camera. And this uh, hot shoe with the correct flash will uh, meter your flash photography in the camera body like a, an OM2 like Olympus or like the F3 does. A few cameras came out with that in the 1980s when the, the patent went uh, open so everybody could do that for a change. Uh, there's no uh, window or curtain here to cover up the window because when you use the self timer 
it flips the mirror up right away and then 10 seconds later it takes the picture so you don't have to worry about light coming in the back when you're using your this uh, your uh, self timer so it doesn't need a cover they didn't have to put one on there where is it here like this yeah. No need for it on the LX because the way that it, that self timer works. And let's take a look at the self timer here. Do we see? We got the shutter button. We got the re, the film advance right here. Done the back. Yeah, we're right up to here. All right. So we have here the lens release button. See, that's that little thing that sticks up there. See it going down. That's so you can turn the lens on it. And then we have a multifunction over here. And we need a lens to show this. So find the red dot, line it up. Whoa, come on. Okay, now here we have our f stops. And here we have the scale for our focusing ring. And our depth of field scale there. There's an aperture direct read out there that reads the f-stop off of the lens. The Pentax lenses have half-stop intervals. For example, except at the end, f2 goes to f2.8, then halfway, then f4, then 4.5, then 5.6, 5.6.5, f8, f8.5, F11, F11 and a half, F16, and then all the way to F22. So it's just at both ends that you have a, a full stop between. All the middle ones are all half stop intervals. So you, so you can be, that's, it's kind of funny when you look, watch the uh, LEDs in your viewfinder because you turn and it moves it and then you turn it again and it doesn't. You turn and it moves it and it, you turn it again and it doesn't. So uh, it's kind of fun doing that. But, what were we doing? Oh, we were talking about this button here. All right, so, uh, let's see, put it on F8. Now, you can watch down the lens. I'm going to push this to the side. There we go. That one opens a little bit slowly. There we go. See the shutter close, or the, the um, aperture uh, opening gets smaller, and then it gets bigger, and if you press this button down and push this all the way, listen here, it shuts down the aperture. You can let go of it and it locks up the mirror. So that way you can always do mirror exposures like that uh, where you don't have the mirror vibrating the camera. So it's kind of a cool thing that they have the mirror lockup, and they have the depth of field preview all built into one. Now to undo it, you push the button, and it snaps back to normal, like that. Now let's see, we have done all that on the camera, and on the auto winder, and now I tell you the last part about this one is about the lens, because. This was a real, real story in itself. Uh, let's see. Lens, lens, go away. No, here we go. Here we go. Right in the center. There we go. See that? All right. Now I can tell you the story. After I ordered the camera, and it came with an auto winder, but it did not come with the lens. I had this one lens on my MX, and so naturally, the first thing I did was look up another 50 millimeter. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, I have a 50 millimeter in Pentax. Why don't I be a little bit creative and do something a little bit different? And lately I have been uh, really getting, getting into the uh, 35 millimeter lens. It's, uh, it's just slightly wide angle. Um, and I found that 28 millimeter lenses, wide angle lenses, are everywhere. You, you got the beat them with a stick. There's so many and, and they don't bring much money. Um, and I don't really, yeah, you know, I have 28s 
and, and I, I use it, but it kind of just flattens out your horizon and everything in the distance. It's like if anything's far away, it's further away. And I found the 35 millimeter lens to be something that gives you, it's like a 50 millimeter lens, it's just a little bit more. But it doesn't have the flattening perspective of, of the real wide, wider angle lens, a 28 or a 24 or a 20, something like that. Um, so the 35 is kind of pleasant for general photography as a substitute for your 50, except that usually your 50 is a 1.8, this one is a 1.4, and your other lens is going to be an f2.8. But uh, the, the other thing I find is that because 28s are so common and the 35s didn't get so much use, that 35s tend to go for a good bit more than 28 millimeters. So I started looking up 35 millimeter f2.8 lenses on eBay and in, in the Asahi Pentax mount, not, not, uh, not just mount, but in, in actual Pentax lenses, because I just wanted to get regular manufacturer lenses for these. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, 28 millimeters pop up all over the place, because they're all over the place, and they're running, you know, 60, 70, 75 bucks, something like that. The 35 millimeters, they tend to run, uh, this 35 millimeter f2.8, they have a tendency to run about 110, 115, 120 plus over, overvalued shipping. Um, but the, uh, the 35 millimeter is, uh, you know, f2.8 is st a little bit high, but uh, let me look down some more because there seem to be some, not, not nearly as many pages as 28 millimeters, but 35s you can get f2.8. And all of a sudden I came across one and it caught my eye because it said uh, $89.99. And I thought, okay, well, what's wrong with it? What's the catch here? Because everything had been like $110 plus $30 or $40 shipping. Here's one that was $89 and then I think it was $17 shipping and some tax. But uh, I looked at this one and it, it got my attention for some reason. But I was looking at it and something seem kind of weird about this lens and I've been looking for a while online and I was getting hungry and I thought you know what I'm going to have a treat myself to a sub today so I left the computer on here at the desk and, and I got my phone got the phone number for the pizza or the, the uh, sub place and I called and ordered a sub and got on my motorcycle rode across town to the sub place got my sub rode back home Park the motorcycle, go inside, and set up my lunch to eat. I'm gonna, gotta, gonna eat half my sub and have have the other half for dinner. And I get a drink out, and I'm all ready to sit down to eat. I'm getting hungry, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? And I go running back into my room, and the computer's still on. It's still on this 20 or this 35 millimeter f 2.8 ad. And I'm looking at it, and I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they did this. This can't be doing, it can't be right. So I, I look at the pictures, and I go to the copy on the ad, and I read the stuff, and I check the serial numbers that they have in the ad. This is just for the lens here. The, the camera's already ordered from somebody else. But... They have the serial number in the ad. It's the same serial number that's on the picture. But somebody at uh, Japcam, wherever they are, I don't know where they are, I can imagine, they put down in the advertisement a 35 millimeter f2.8, which you might see from that, that might be come across as a 2.8, but this lens is actually a 35 millimeter f2. So I quick changed my search for Pentax 35 millimeter f2, and I found two of them, and they're starting at $200, and the shipping goes up from there. So 
apparently somebody at JAPCAM didn't look very carefully when they put this listing up. You know, I'm sure somebody was doing a, a dozen listings from something that they had, you know, purchased that they had just brought in. Uh, but they had this lens listed for $89. And they had it marked as a 35mm f2.8. But it's not a 35mm f2.8. This is a, a whole stop faster and about $100 more. But it was $89. And I thought, well, you know what? If that's the kind of business that you're doing, you should be more careful because somebody like me is going to come along and buy it. And I did because there it is. And it was a 35mm F2 for $89.99 plus shipping. So that's the whole story on my Pentax LX camera setup and the first lens that goes on it. Um, we uh, we didn't do a direct comparison, but you get the idea. Whoa, these things just tower over this. Part of it is the auto winder, but yeah, look at that. So when it comes to going out and taking pictures, if I decide that I want to have the film advanced for me, I'm going to be taking this one. It's a little bit a little bit beat up on the corners here on top. But other than that, this thing is a thing of beauty and a wonderful little camera. And uh, I could see where people would like this. This gives you all those mechanical shutter speeds in case your batteries die. And in case the batteries don't die, it's got all full expo auto exposure. And it's just a magnificent camera. I think this is maybe the best of all the pro cameras from the manufacturers. It'd be in there close with, uh, with Olympus for the OM4T, which is really great. But, oh, last thing I'll tell you about this. The other thing, as well as the 1 90th of a second shutter, is that this has, it says, a titanium shutter. That's what it's listed as. I don't know. That's what I've read. It, it kind of looks like it's cotton there, but it says it's titanium. I don't know. I'm not going to push on it and see. Put my finger through it. So, that's the story on the LX. Uh, leave me a comment, like and subscribe. Thank you for coming by to visit and we will take a look at some other cameras on another day. So until then, this is Mr. Gibson Guy and I am out of here.